Hello and welcome back to this series on writing games with Coco Sharp and Visual Studio. In the last video we left off here with effectively a default application which doesn't really do very much. It's a, a blue layer with a label on it saying hello Coco Sharp and that's all it does but it kind of includes a, a bit more nuts and bolts than that so I want to just spend a couple of minutes looking at the kind of the basic layout of the application and the way in which it's possible to extract most of the common code into the shared project and leave just a minimal amount of device specific stuff in each of these projects. Now I've deleted the iOS one just so it's uh, less confusing stuff. I've just got an Android one and I've got a shared library. And so the first thing to kind of understand is that as you might imagine, if you're on Android, the first thing you're going to expect to do as an Android operating system is to find the entry point of the application, the entry point of your game. And in Android, the terminology is activity. You have an activity and it's marked as the main activity in the manifest. And then the operating system will kind of find that and say, right, can you launch this thing called program. Now we could call this anything. It doesn't have to be called program. In fact, in some of the other examples is actually called main activity, which is a little bit probably more correct. So I'm just going to change that to be main activity. Just say yes. Uh, and that's kind of what you do in Android. So it looks a little bit better. Program is a little bit kind of dot net dot net style. And the only thing that really happens in here is we have an event handler which says, well, when this activity is created, do some stuff. So we already looked at this before. We can set the Android icon themes um, and the things like the screen orientation and stuff. Do we allow it to have a keyboard or not? Do we allow it to have multiple orientations depending on the game? That's up to you. There's a kind of a thing about people like using their phone in portrait if possible, because that's how you normally hold your phone. Obviously, some games you're going to have to play in landscape. And I guess there's some that probably doesn't matter which way around you play them. So we're not too bothered about that for now. But if we look here at what happens in on create, we call the base class, which again is pretty common in lots of frameworks to do that. Just so the base class, in this case, Android game activity, which interestingly comes from the Microsoft XNA namespace, which is interesting for a framework that's not maintained anymore. But anyway, we won't even go there. And what it does is it creates a new CC application. Now, this is a Coco Sharp class. You will always need one of these. And it's not one that you're overriding yourself. It's one that comes in the framework. So you just create a new one of those. And this is obviously the top level container for all of the Coco Sharp stuff. And then what we do is we attach our delegate. So we attach something that's going to handle the various events that occur when this application starts and stops and pauses and everything like that. We're then going to set the content view for this activity. So this is quite kind of Android style. You do the same in Java. You're saying, well, you're running the main activity. I want to set the content of my activity to be the Android content view that comes from the application. Uh, if we go in there, we'll see there'll be a, a you know a couple of different things that are available. But in this case, uh, this is actually I think the um, the Android version of this anyway. But it's going to get an Android view, and it's going to set that as the content view, and it just goes start game. Now, obviously, in most applications, you wouldn't normally have a method called start game, but because this is a game framework, it's got a method that's going to start turning on message loops and timers and everything else is going to happen. So really, there isn't very much in here that's specific that specific to our game. That stuff's pretty boilerplate. And these things, you know, a lot of them will be the same on different games, labels, etc. But for now, we're not really too bothered about these sorts of details. The main one is we set it to portrait. And other than that, we're kind of happy. So if we go to our app delegate, so notice that the app delegate is actually in the shared project. And that's because this basic code here is going to work across all platforms. So things like setting a window size, uh, it's telling it where to find content and things like that. Well, it's not really Android specific at all. It's just general stuff. So it can go in here and this can be shared, which is really nice then. 
because it just means that a lot of the stuff that we do, we only have to write the code once. And a couple of things to notice in here, we're setting a width and height. Now, as I mentioned in the last video, this is four by three size. At the minute, I'm not too bothered about screen sizes. There's, you've got a couple of options really, but I haven't done enough reading yet about the, the different options you have available. But a couple of things just off the top of my head, you can set a fixed size if you're emulating, say, a Game Boy or something like that, then you might want the screen to be exactly the size of a Game Boy screen, regardless of how big the device is. So there's one reason you might choose a fixed size. You might also take something and just say scale it up to the size of the screen. So however big the screen is, make this fit it. Of course, the danger there, if you do that, is that on something like an iPad, you might end up with a really big everything be really big look like kind of um you know look like low resolution on a high res screen so it won't be necessarily very nice to look at the other thing of course is you can scale it so you could say well it's the same scale on all the screens but i can fit more of it in so if you had like a map game you might be able to see more of the map on an ipad than you can on a phone so you got a couple of different things like that and you can also use in the case of android at least android layouts described in xml just like you can in android so you can say actually i want to use a stack layout or a horizontal layout or a vertical layout there in most cases probably not as useful in games but it's nice that you can use them because if you're using something like a menu or an option screen it might just be easier to lay them out in a view than it is to do it all in code so there are your kind of options the next bit down here is we're kind of saying well just like in Android and the same in iOS, you've got a number of different sizes of images that you can set. So in here by default, I think it just says high definition or high density and low density. You can have more of those. You can have as, as many as you like. Uh, in Android, I think by default, there are about six different sizes from like extra small to extra, extra large or something. And that just allows you to say, well, if I've got a small phone with a small screen, I might as well load a small image because it will make it run quicker and it's not going to look any better loading a large image and then having to downsize it. So you can get a, a size that's appropriate. And here they just do some basic stuff saying, well, if the size that we've set here is smaller than the window, then probably we want to use high definition high definition images because we're going to start stretching them maybe and so you know we want to make sure they look good in hd but in this case we, we haven't got any images in there so it's not really relevant for us and then we kind of have this concept of scenes and layers now scenes are kind of relevant if you're going to have cameras and multiple scenes and stuff like that because it allows you to have potentially more than one window onto the same thing so sometimes if you've got, say, separate cameras like Flight Simulator has separate cameras looking at different things, you can create those as multiple scenes. But even if you're not using multiple scenes, you want one main scene. Uh, you always need to have at least one. And then if you see what happens here is we pass in the main window so the scene knows how big it needs to be. And then we create a layer. And in this case, this layer we're going to look at is where most of our kind of activity code is. This one's called intro layer, but again, that's probably for what we're doing. Not a great name. That's just what um, it's called by default. So let's just change that to be our game layer. Because in, obviously in some games you would have a... Is that not going to rename that either? Nope. Great. In some games you're going to have a loading screen. You might have an intro. You might have a load of credits or something like that. And so you could have multiple layers and you could have one that comes up for maybe five seconds and then goes to the game. But for now, we're just going to have one layer. It's called the game layer. It's just going to have, you know, the, the game, the bat and the ball. We then need to add the layer to the scene. So one thing to kind of understand about Coco Sharp, about Coco 2D generally, is that it has this concept of like a composite pattern where everything's kind of a node and nodes can have children. So a scene can have a game layer. A game layer can have child's... Um, kind of items grids a grid could have child items and you basically end up with this big hierarchy of things that get drawn in order so the things that are lower down generally get drawn on top of the things that are higher up which kind of makes sense you draw the layer first then you draw the items within the layer so you'll see this quite often add child in this case we're calling it on the scene object add child and we're passing it the layer and in this case we're telling the main window here to run with the scene that we've just created so we've got a couple of different things we could do there, but at the minute we're 
kind of keeping it real simple and just telling it to start running that scene immediately. Obviously, we could run it with a time and, and all kinds of stuff. Now, at the moment, we don't do anything particularly tricky for uh, where, when the application gets put into the background or the foreground. So this would happen both when you hit the show all applications button on Android and it shows everything in the list or if you go back home anything that takes focus away then this is going to get called in this case we tell the application object that we're paused and that allows it to pause anything like timers and um, heartbeats and things that might be running the game can all get paused just so that it doesn't carry on using loads of energy obviously with some games we could do a whole load of stuff so in our bouncing ball game we could either just take it back to the main menu. We could automatically pause the game so when they come back in, the user could unpause it manually. So there's obviously lots of different things we can do, but at the minute, all we do is just set that flag there. So again, not a, really a lot to worry about here at the moment. We're just going to spend some time on this. Sorry, I've just renamed it. So that's now an error. So let's just run this a second so we can see exactly what it looks like. So this should look... Um, I think like it looked before. I don't think I've changed anything. So it's in portrait. It's a blue background. And it's going to show uh, that kind of hello Coco Sharp thing in the middle. So there you go. Nothing particularly tricky at all. So like I say, just leave that open. If you close it and open it, it takes ages. But if you just stop it in here, you can change your code. So a couple of first things to notice is the general style is you create a, a, an item. So if you go into, say, CC label, press F12 on that, uh, you'll notice that a label is a node. So anything that's a node, which is anything that's drawable, can get added as a child to this CC layer color, which we'll find is a layer. And you'll find that a layer is also a node. So a layer can have children. And in this case, we're adding a label to it. Now, in terms of positioning, you can either position it now before you add it, or in our case, we're positioning it later. And the reason we're positioning it later is we actually want to know what the visible bounds is. And we're not going to know that until this is added to a scene because the scene doesn't know how big it is until it's actually created. So that's why we don't we can't do everything in a constructor. We can't compute window sizes in the constructor. But in this case, we know what we want the text to be, what the type of font is and how big it is. I'm not going to bother changing any of that. You could, we could do if we want. But let's just first off make that black because I think blue is a little bit nasty. So we're just going to change that. And if you notice there, this is a color which has four four bytes to it. So it's RGBA, which is red, green, blue, and then the opacity level, the transparency. What we're doing here initially then is again called the base class in added to scene, but this is where we're gonna know how visible our um, window is. Or sorry, we know the bounds of our visible window. So we're getting that. And in this case, we're saying the position of the label is the center of our window bounds. And we'll ignore, ignore this for a second because it's not actually doing anything at the minute. So as we've said, if we run that, it's going to be black now instead of blue, but it's going to run the text. Now, in our bouncing ball game that we're going to build our kind of Arkanoid knockoff, if we turn this label into the score, <clears throat> we don't really want it in the middle of the screen. So the first thing that we can do really easily is move it. Now, it's quite interesting here. Let's uh, position, if you look, is actually a CC point, and we can set that directly, or we can set X and Y individually. So we could do um, X equals zero. Now, zero is bottom left for X and Y. So let's have a look what happens if we do that, and we run it again. We'll notice that the text is actually off the bottom corner of our window. Remember, our window doesn't go all the way to the bottom. So what's actually happened here is that position is the center of this item. And that might seem a bit weird because you might be thinking, well, hang on a second. It's, you know, isn't it normal to have 
one of the corners, the bottom left or the top left corner being zero, zero of an item. And of course, in normal desktop applications and stuff, that's usually true. But when you're talking about games, almost invariably, it's more useful to be dealing with the center of an item, especially when you're dealing with collisions and things like that. It's easier to collide with the center of an item, perhaps with a radius, than it is to be working everything out from the bottom left corner. So it does make sense that position X and Y are the center, but it does make the positioning of that a little bit more annoying. So there's a couple of things we could do here, but if we add half of the width of that label and half of the height of the label to the Y, then that's gonna end up uh, moving it to the right place. Now, obviously zero plus something, uh, we don't need to bother with the zero. So if we actually get the label uh, dot, uh, can't remember what, uh, uh, it is something like bounding box, is it? Dot. No, it's not bounding box. Yeah, it's trying to find the um, window dot width. Window size in pixels dot width divided by two. And then the same, so we're taking its window size. Um, obviously, I can't guarantee that this is the best way to do it, but um, we're just going to do that. So by adding half of the height, to the label position in X and Y. We're just pushing it off of that bottom corner. And hopefully now we can read the label. Oh, and so what have I done? Oh, it's not label.windows. Label dot do 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 uh, sorry it's a bit amateur isn't it? Uh I had it just earlier on. It's not position parent. Do, 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 do. Just talk quietly amongst yourself. Uh, visible bounds. Oh, that might be actually. Can't, I can't even remember how I found it before. That's the thing that's a bit, um, a bit weird. That's a rect dot, so that's going to be get width, is it? No. Oh. Anyway, you get the idea. I'll fix that um, in a bit because I'm not going to waste your time um, doing all this crazy stuff. But basically, if we add um, half of the width of the label then and half the height, we're going to move that back on. And the other thing is you might as well just change it so it kind of starts with score of kind of zero. So that's that. We'll, um, let's just put these two hard-coded numbers for now so it compiles let's just say 30 and 30 it should be all right I'm trying to remember how to get the, uh, the size of the label um, so once we've done that now that should look a, a bit better so obviously one of the things that we have to do a lot of in 2D games is drawing objects. And we've got a couple of ways of, uh, of drawing the objects. So uh, yeah, that position Y is not quite far enough, but I'll change that. And we wanna draw ourselves a bat for our bouncy ball game. So the kind of the, one of the easiest ways we could do it is we can do a, uh, use what's called a draw node. So it's an easy draw node and we'll call this paddle. And then in a similar way to what we did with the label, let's get rid of some of these comments because they're a bit taking up room. So we're going to do paddle equals new CC draw node. And then we are going to set its position. So um, this is the draw node. Draw, oh, so it's called paddle, isn't it? Paddle dot position x we're just going to set these to roughly the right place paddle dot position y these are kind of examples of the sorts of things that like a the difference between maybe a very well programmed game and something you, that you're just throwing together trying to work out exactly where these things should be on different screen sizes and you know if the screen rotates all those kinds of things it actually take can take quite a lot of time trying to work out what value you're actually trying to use and another thing to remember with most gaming frameworks is that the number of pixels and your kind of 
um, what do they call it, kind of world size might not be the same. So 100 units in your world size might be 200 pixels or it might be 100 pixels or it might be 50 pixels. So you kind of need to understand those transforms a little bit as well. But let's say we're going to set that, that position here. But the other thing that we now need to do with this is because it's a draw node, we need to draw something. So we can draw a rectangle. And if we draw a rectangle, we want a new CC rect. Everything CC for Coco. And the constructor for CC rect is um, X and Y. So we'll just put zero and zero. Width, um, I'm going to do something like this is probably about right. And then the other thing I need to do is add child because I want this to draw with my game layer. So that's going to compile, whether it looks correct or not. We'll have a look. OK, so we've got a bat, which is lovely. For some reason, that oh, I should have changed X, not Y. That's why that's in the wrong place. So that's great, but paddle's not very good if it doesn't move. We're going to have a bouncy ball kind of hitting that. So we're going to need that to move. Let me just try and get that even remotely correct. And this is where touch events come in. So with touch events, we effectively create these kind of global event handlers. It's kind of a bit, it's not really very .NET because these just kind of appear from nowhere. You create one and then attach an event to it. And then you call kind of add event listener on the node. So it's a kind of a little bit, um, I don't know, roundabout way of doing it. But it's kind of, you know, it, it is what it is. So in this case, we're attaching to the touches ended um, event. And that's what happens is when you press something and let go, you get a touch end. If you press it and move it and let go, you don't get a touch end. So we'll, we'll find out what that looks like in a second. So this you get this by default anyway this code here but at the minute as you can see it doesn't really do anything one of the things we've got to make sure is that there is actually a touches count i don't understand how you this would be called without any touches but anyway let's just assume it does so what we can do here is we can get um, a location the location on the screen equals we only really care about the first touch. If somebody starts touching with two or three fingers, not really much we can do about that. We could ignore it. We could say if counts greater than one, don't do anything or do something different. Of course, there's a lot of logic we could do. But for now, again, we'll try and keep it fairly simple. So this is basically here. This now is a point on the screen where that touch was let go of because this is touches end. And then what we can do, remember we've got our, our paddle, is we can do paddle dot position x, because we only want to move it left and right, equals location on screen dot x. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Get the actual, so this touch is basically a set of fingers. And obviously most devices now support multi-touch. You have one finger, two finger, drag, three finger, select, etc., etc. So we're going to get sent a list of these. We're going to choose the first one, i.e. array index zero, get its location. Where was that touch let go of? And then we're going to move the X position of the paddle to be the position where the person clicked. So assuming that this all builds correctly, which hopefully it will. We'll get up our black screen with a paddle. And <clears throat> if we click it, you see it's moving. Now, there's things like that where we kind of go, mm, actually, don't really want it to go off the screen. So these are all the sorts of things that actually start taking time when you start developing games for real because they're sort of edge cases that you don't necessarily think of. This is really the, the basic logic involved. But what about an edge case? And also the other thing is the paddle is going to so that the kind of zero, zero is is going to here on the paddle whereas maybe i kind of really want it to be the center so again there's some kind of maths that i'd need to do but one thing that you might notice uh, here is what happens if i drag it nothing happens except when i let go and the touch end fires which is a bit rubbish because in most cases probably i'm going to want to drag the paddle 
not just click. I'd also notice if I click up here again, I might, I might want to say well, only do it if I'm clicking down here. So if I'm clicking up here, I'm almost certainly not moving the paddle because it wouldn't make sense to be moving the paddle from the top of the screen. So I can do some extra logic there, but the click stuff basically works a little bit nasty. Uh, again, I need to get the um, the width of that rectangle. In fact, I know what the width is because I've set it to 120. So I could say uh, the percentage of X equals the location of X. Um, now what? Minus or plus? Minus uh, 60, which is... Oh, let me just stop that. Which is half of the width of the bat. I think I think that's the right way around. We shall find out very soon. Oh, look at that. Spot on. So that at least moves to where we expect, but it's not handling the move event. So how do we handle move? Well, as you might imagine, it's pretty similar. Touch listener. So we've already got the touch listener. It's the same touch listener. And then what we're going to say is on touches moved equals and the handler for touches moved is different than the handler for, I think it is anyway, than the handler for on touches ended. Are they the same or are they different? Because if they're the same, oh, they are the same. So actually, I might that might actually work with the same event handler. So let's actually see if that does work. Because if it doesn't, I'll, um, I'll just create another event handler. So we're saying here, if you tap it or move it, then, okay, so works with move. Actually, what's probably happening is it's probably hitting that twice because I think probably while it's moving, it's going to be calling it. And then if I let go, it's probably firing it again. But because that's all happening very quickly, I don't really notice. So straight away, we've managed to do something, you know, pretty cool by showing the, the bat moving. There's a couple of things really that we want to do here. Uh, just one of them to mention and one of them to improve this a little bit. So let's stop this. The first thing to think about is that if you're only targeting mobile applications, then having a kind of a draggy thing on the screen using a finger probably going to work OK. But what you need to ask is what happens if this is going to be on a tablet? What happens if it's on a desktop or an Xbox? a console with a controller, then the input is going to be different. And you need to really carefully think about that because actually for certain types of games, they're very hard to translate from one type of control to another. So things like, say, Call of Duty, where you think you've got about eight buttons that you use to do all different kinds of stuff. How do you translate that? to a mobile where you haven't got, well, you have got a keyboard, but you're not going to want it covering up half of your game screen. So what happens, you, you know, you're going to try and have eight little buttons across the screen. Is that even going to work? So you need to kind of think about those things as you go along, because actually they can make a big difference to either A, how you design your game in the first place, uh, and you don't want to end up designing it or building a load of stuff and then realizing it doesn't work on another platform, or saying actually, this game is only going to work on a mobile because it's just not going to work with a controller or the other way around. So that's one thing to mention. The other thing is, in most cases, I mean, if we run that thing up again, that paddle there is pretty kind of ugly. It's just really a, a rectangle. We can obviously make it a different color and stuff, but uh, it kind of looks a bit like Pong on the old Atari. Whereas, you know, we kind of think, well, maybe if we want a bit something a little bit more professional looking then we want to use a graphic and fortunately using graphics is you know is almost as easy as as using a rectangle like that so instead of having a draw node let's have a sprite and we're going to call this paddle and i'm going to get rid of that paddle now because these are both nodes the nice thing is this code will still work the same or they need to find out whether that maths is still correct but we now got a sprite, so this is not going to be a draw node anymore. It's going to be a CC sprite. And what we're going to do with this is we need to load an image. Now, if you notice here, I've got a ball and a paddle in the content folder of my assets in Android. And these are downloaded from the bouncy ball game, which is on the Xamarin samples site. So if you look here, if you go to developer.xamarin.com, 
and search in the samples for bouncing game you can download the code here and get those two graphics out but you know they're fairly basic graphics but obviously on a real game some people spend a lot of time and money kind of making that ball look a bit 3d making the paddle look a bit cooler i mean there's you know there's not really very much to both of those but they certainly look nicer than my white rectangle so i need to give tell it what to load now if you remember back in the app delegate we actually told it where the content root directory was so by telling it that when we actually load the sprite it's going to say well i'm going to look in the content folder and <clears throat> it's going to find paddle doesn't care that it's png it will work that out now this is one of those things that i that we need to mention when using cross-platform game development it might not be so much of a big deal now that windows phone isn't really targeted anymore but the resources work differently on different platforms so android can handle a png windows phone can't so with Windows Phone, you'd have to convert that paddle.png into an XNB, which is a cross-platform resource file, which Windows Phone supports. Why Windows doesn't support those natively, I don't know. It just doesn't. But that's why the resources are specified within the platform-specific folders and not under the, uh, the common project. So we load the sprite. The position is going to be the same, so that's fine as well. We're obviously not going to draw rect, and we're going to add child. So we haven't changed much code. If you look, that's so let's get rid of that. Don't want that anymore. So we specify the pad, um, a sprite. We've loaded the graphic for it. Obviously, that graphic is going to be as big as the graphic is in here, unless we scale it. But we haven't scaled it. Give it a position. Add it as a child to this layer. And like I say, because we called it the same thing, and because all nodes have position stuff. Hopefully we won't have to change that code. So F5 again. And then once this is loaded, we see we've now got a slightly nicer looking paddle. It's a little bit smaller than the rectangle, but that's fine. Now notice that one goes off interestingly on the left hand side, but doesn't go off on the right hand side. So again, we can do something with that. We basically need to bounds check this to bet to say depending on what that value is because if you look here it's actually i think it's that 60 pixels isn't it that's the problem for some reason with this the anchor point looks slightly different and i know you can change the anchor point but i'm not gonna embarrass myself now by not knowing how to do that so let's just try that quickly because i think um think that might work like that <clears throat> okay so that works for that one so it still goes off, but it only goes off by half because once that arrow goes past the edge of the screen, then the app's not handling the mouse move anymore. So again, we could kind of restrict that and say, no, you can't go that far. You can't go any further than that if we want. Uh, it's just going to be some extra logic in here. Like, you know, position X is the greater of zero or location on screen dot X. So, you know, there's there's stuff we can do there, which is cool. Right. So that's that bit. What we can do, we can make this paddle look nicer. We can decorate it. I mean, what we're eventually going to do is start drawing some blocks up here. We're going to get the ball and start making the ball bounce and bounce off the walls and stuff like that. But I think for now, that's enough just to show you the basics of here. We've got one scene. And for most of these simple games, you will only have one scene. Uh, you then have a single layer. In this case, we've called it game layer. You can call it whatever you like. Because it's a color layer, it just allows you very easily to set the background color and nothing else. And then it's pretty much a blank canvas for you to put stuff on very specifically wherever you want. So as I mentioned earlier, ideally, you would compute some of these values from the size of the window, which might mean you can't do it here. You might have to do it down here like it does for the label and once you've done that you can then make sure that the the screen scales correctly to the device or you could have a, a number of set sizes you could say well this works on three thick sizes and that's it because if you need the ratio of of height and width to be a certain value or whatever then you could also do it that way so that's all we're going to do for now and in the next video we're going to add the ball into the mix and show how the physics 
can add that basically the, the movement and the bounding of that ball and how it can hit the bat and bounce back up again. So uh, any questions or comments, please let me know below. Otherwise, I'll see you in video three.